Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, so today, again, we're going to focus on concurrency control. We're going to look at uh, a bit of theory. And we're also going to uh, look at the different types uh, of uh, locking mechanism and introduce a new set of locks, especially multi-granularity lock. And so far, we've been looking at a couple of concurrency controls. So the intention was to you kind of appreciate the overall uh, algorithm and intuition, now kind of going back and look at a theory. Now that you've seen example of both uh, classical concurrency control, 2PL, and also you've seen modern concurrency control like 2BCC and Quick. As part of that, as a reminder, we'll go over 2PL again. Again, 2PL is sort of the basis of uh, locking concurrency control. And it's something that is implemented in majority of uh, database system. So knowing 2PL already covers uh, most of the field in terms of uh, its practical application. So let's begin with our terminology again. Again, some of these terminology we've, we've discussed before, but I think it's good to review them. So what is a serializable schedule? So, or a serial schedule first, let's start with that, is that the schedule that basically is a serial execution of all transaction. So conceptually, one transaction being executed after another, and there's zero interleaving of any actions. So if you do a strict single thread of let's say execution, one tr transaction at a time, that becomes a gold standard. And that becomes, the basis of concurrency control. Because we know if you do single transaction at a time, oh, trivially, there is no concurrent execution. Therefore, there cannot be any concurrent anomalies. So now if you do concurrent execution, and then later we can show that is equivalent to that serial execution, then we can be very confident in terms of its correctness. So, and what is an equivalent schedule? So we can have two different schedules. How do we say that one is equivalent to another? Is that you could say the basic is that if the net effect, if you run this schedule and then run the second schedule and the final outcome of the database or final state of the database after executing those two schedules are identical, well, then we can say the, the schedules were equivalent. So now what is a serializable schedule? So any schedule, which is an interleaving of operations of any transactions, if a given a schedule can be mapped to some serial execution, then we can say that's a serializable schedule. So if the database goes ahead and start interleaving operations while it's doing a concurrent execution, and once it finishes an execution, that interleaving of the operation becomes the schedule. If now I take that as scheduled and I can map it to some or to any serial, serial schedule, doesn't matter which one, any permutation, it's fine. As long as I can map it to any serial schedule, then I can be confident because it is mapped to some serial schedule then I can be confident that there are no uh, concurrent anomalies in the execution. Because as we said, if the schedule was serial, if, you, if I were to execute transactions serially, there are no concurrency anomalies. And so if I have a schedule that does include interleaving of the operations of different transactions, but I can still map it to some serial schedule, then I can be certain that there are no anomalies due to the concurrent execution. So that's sort of the basic intuition. And we can now further uh, strict, uh, strengthen this assumption, or maybe even to a sense relax this assumption. We say two schedules are conflict equivalent that we only focus on conflicting operation. So if the operations of a transaction, let's imagine a workload 
are the thought experiments that every transaction touches a different or disjoint set of records. Under that workload, I can basically interleave any operation of any transaction in any arbitrary order always without worrying about anything because no transaction actually conflict with another. So if no transaction are conflicting with another transaction, it doesn't matter in what order I execute. If some transaction only touches uh, Alex data and another transaction only touches Alice data, then it doesn't matter which order I execute it. It's always going to have the same net effect. So we can formalize this and say two schedules are conflict equivalent because we're really interested about when the actions are conflicting. If there's no conflict, then it doesn't really matter what order I execute them. But if there are, if there are conflict, so if we define conflict equivalent as if they involve the same action of the same transaction, but more importantly, every pair of conflicting action is ordered the same way. So when we, when we want to see if in the schedule is equivalent to some serial schedule, we can only limit our focus or reduce our focus to only conflicting actions. For non-conflicting action, it doesn't really matter. For conflicting the action, they must be ordered in the same way. In other words, they must be ordered in a serial way. In other words, if transaction T1 and T2 are conflicting, then our, their operation must always be either T1 by follow, T1 followed by T2, or T2 by follow T1. We cannot mix that. So as long as for all conflicting operation, they are always ordered in the same way, then we can say this does correspond to some serial schedule. And so now taking this concept of conflict to serializability, so formally scheduled S is conflict serializable if it's conflict equivalent to some serial schedule. So it's conflict equivalent to some serial schedule. Again, we are all only concerned before when we say it's equivalent to some serial schedule, we say interleaving is fine as long as the interleaving follows the same operation. So for all operation, it's always the case that operation for T1 is always followed by T2. But now we say it's conflict serializable is that the operation T1 needs to be followed before T2, if and only if they're actually in conflict. If T1 and T2 are not in conflict, then some operation of T1 can happen before T2, but some other operation of uh, T1 could happen after T2 if they're not conf if they're if T1 and T2 are not in conflict. So this strict ordering or this total ordering it only applies when there is conflict. In other words, when we talk about conflict serializable, a partial ordering is sufficient, meaning we define ordering only on conflicting transaction and we're not concerned with transactions that have no conflict. And in fact, if you think about it, the way the locking mechanism work as a method to implement uh, serializable, it in fact, it's only provides us conflict serializable. A 2PL does not provide us a true serializable uh, because if there is no conflict, the, the locks can be granted in any order and it does not enforce an ordering among uh, the non-conflicting operation. So locking produce conflict serializable uh, as opposed to just the general serializable, which is a, a stronger, uh, is a stronger uh, requirement. Conflict serializable is, uh, it's, it's relaxed. So there are, so every, every conflict serializable transaction, or maybe I shall say the other way, any serializable scheduled will always be conflict serializable, but the converse is not true. 
not every conflict serializable will be serializable because uh, the conflict serializable does not impose any ordering uh, condition on non-conflicting transactions versus the serializable have a strict ordering on all operation, irrespective of whether they're conflicting or not conflicting. And in general, in databases, we, in practical application of databases, we're only concerned with conflict serializable. We're not concerned if uh, there's no conflict, then it doesn't make any difference in what order it's being executed. So I'll pause here. Any question? Most of this we've kind of been talking about now. This is just bring a little bit of formalism uh, and vocabulary uh, to the concept that we have covered so far. Okay. So let's look at a couple of examples. So scheduled. So now the question, is this a scheduled conflict serializable or not? So what is, the, what is the schedule that we're looking at? Is that we have two transactions, T1 and T2. T1 reads A, then writes A. Then T2 starts, interleave the operation between T1. So T2 reads A, and then later writes A. But then also T2 goes ahead and reads B and then writes B. And now we switch back to T1. And what happens with T1? T1 is now also wants to uh, read uh, B. So it goes ahead and read, uh, re uh, it reads B and then it also writes to B. So we know T1 and T2 are conflicting because they're both reading and writing to A and B. But as we see, the first conflicting operation, which is on A, we have T1 preceding T2. But on the second conflicting operation, the order has been reversed. So first T2 happens, then T1 it happens. So whenever we have this conflict in order on conflicting operation, then we say the transaction or the schedule is not conflict serializable. And so that's the basic, uh, the, basic, uh, the basic message. If there are conflicting operations between T1 and T2, it's okay to interleave them as long as we always stick with one order. Either T1 precedes for all operation before T2 or T2 precedes T1, but we cannot mix the two. And if we do, then we get into uh, having cycle in what is referred to as dependency graph. And we can, I'm gonna go over how to construct the dependency graph. Any question on this? Is that clear? Again, the cycle reveals that there is, uh, there is conflict. And what the dependency graph is basically says is very simple. It's we have an edge from TI to TJ. There's an edge from TI to TJ. If TJ reads or writes an object that was last written by TI. So in our example, since T1 writes and T2 reads A, what is written by T1, then there is an edge, there is this uh, orange edge from T2 to T1 because T2 read A, which was written by T1. So we have this orange edge. But however, in the later part, since T1 is reading B and B was last written by T2, then now we have T1 pointing to T2 because T1 is reading the data that was uh, written by uh, T2. Therefore, we have a cycle. And 
if, you, if we're given a schedule and if we draw the dependency graph and we see there is a cycle in the dependency graph, then we say uh, that, then we say that uh, this schedule that we're given, if we discover that dependency, if we discover that there is a cycle, then it's no longer conflict serializable. Any question? So, the th so our theorem says the schedule is conflict serializable if and only if its dependency graph is a cyclic. So as long as we can show the dependency graph is a cyclic, then we are certain that uh, the schedule is conflict uh, serializable. Of course, we're not going to. It's, it would be pretty inefficient that we just randomly allow the database to operate in any arbitrary order. And after some time, we draw the dependency graph and to see whether what we did was correct or not. That's, that's not the way we, uh, uh, we, uh, we do the execution. But in terms of its correctness, uh, that would be one possibility. Of course, if you were to follow this method, you kind of have to also hold all these transactions. So you come up with, you go ahead, do a bunch of execution, you come up with the scheduled, but you don't actually make any of these transaction commit, meaning you have to make the user to wait. And once you have the scheduled, then you look at dependency graph. And if there's no cycle, then you say, okay, all of them are committed. If there is cycle, then you can selectively uh, abort some of the transaction and the rest can be now committed. And there could potentially be, of course, cascading work as well too. But that's one way of uh, ensuring that the schedule is uh, correct. But of course you can be proactive. It's the locking mechanism, it ensures the schedule that is realized at the end is always conflict serializable. So that would be the alternative method. Any question? Okay, so kind of a review of the 2PL. So the strict two-phase locking is fairly straightforward. Each transaction either hold a shared log before reading an object or holds an exclusive log or a write log before writing to an object. And of course, it's also correct to just hold an exclusive log across the board. But that would not be efficient because the share lock allows more concurrency. So that's why we have the distinction. As we talk about in 2VCC, we even incorporated a new type of lock as an update lock, which even creates uh, or allows more uh, concurrency. It only uh, prevents write write conflict, but it will not uh, prevent read and write happening at the same time. But the shared and exclusive lock, well, the exclusive one is a strict. As soon as an exclusive lock is set on the record, it conflicts with uh, any future shared or exclusive lock. And it will uh, keep all the reader and writer out till it's done. And it's important for, it, for the strict two-phase locking that these locks are held till the end of the transaction. And as we talked about that before, this is important to avoid cascading abort, uh, cascading aborts. And the essential uh, idea on, uh, on, the two phase, on the two phase locking is that once you release a lock, you can no longer uh, acquire new ones. So that's the central piece of two phase locking. And of course, if you were to implement two-phase locking, any schedule that is produced by two-phase locking is going to have an acyclic graph and therefore it will be conflict serializable. Any question? 
And again, just one more time to make sure that we are all fully, because this is going to be the basis for milestone three. Of course, you can uh, have more uh, enhanced protocols such as 2BCC, Quick, or, or other protocol that we're going to cover in the next uh, two sessions, or any concurrency protocol that, for example, you find in one of your textbook, especially the transaction processing of modern hardware. There, we kind of cover uh, 20, 30 different, if not more, type of concurrency control. Any of those are would be, uh, it would be fine. But the basis is, again, the simple idea of two-phase locking. You hold a shared lock on the object you read, you hold the exclusive lock on the object you write. And again, the most important aspect is kind of emphasizing on it, a transaction cannot request additional lock once it releases any locks. So that's, that's the essential. Uh, that's the essential requirement to ensure the correctness of the protocol and to ensure uh, that uh, this conflict serializable property does hold. And of course, as we said, X locks exclusive. So once you have an X lock, you cannot grant any more further shared lock or exclusive lock. So conflict serializability is one example. And there's a whole array of serializability, uh, weaker form as well, too. So another one that is interesting is view serializability. And scheduled S1 and S2 are view equivalent if these three property is satisfied. If TI reads the initial value of A in S1, then TI also reads the initial value in S2, which is the second schedule. Basically, two schedules are view equivalent if all the transactions read the same initial value. Also, another requirement for it to be view equivalent is that transaction TJ in both S1 and S2 also read the same intermediate values. And finally, any writes by TI would be the same as in T2. So the initial values are the same, the initial value read is the same. The intermediate values read are also the same. And the final written value is also the same. So if you satisfy these requirements, then you can be view serializable. The question is, well, it sounds like very similar to two-phase locking. It seems like we're kind of reading the same values and at the end writing the same values as well. So why is it view serializability not exactly the same as uh, our standard serializability. So let's look at this example. So in this example, we have three transactions. T1 is read A. T2 then writes to A. And then T2 again writes to A. And then T3 writes A as well. So following, so that's one scheduled. The second scheduled is first T1 reads A, then it's write A, then T2 writes, then finally T3 writes. So in terms of initial value, we see that there's actually only one read and in both T1 is reading the initial value. So the first one is satisfied. Now I'll talk about intermediate reads. Well, since there are no intermediate reads, this Second condition is trivially satisfied. And then finally, uh, it's the final value. In both, T, uh, in both scheduled, the final value is that transaction T3 is writing the final value. So all three requirements are satisfied and the, these two schedule are view serializable. But are these two scheduled uh, are also conflict serializable? Or in fact, are these even serializable? So this one you can see is T1 followed by T2 followed by T3. So this is a serializable schedule. And 
and this is view serializable to this schedule, but it's also, is it conflict serializable? If I look at this scheduled, is this a conflict uh, serializable scheduled? Can I implement locking? It is the 2PL, is it possible to have a 2PL, uh, if I were to get, if I were to implement 2PL locking, is this scheduled even allowed? Could this schedule be produced with the 2PL? Because any schedule that the 2PL produce will be conflict serializable. So is this a permissible scheduled under 2PL? I would say yes, because they could have shared locks. T1 could have a shared lock and then after T2 writes, and releases an exclusive lock, then it could upgrade its shared lock to an exclusive, then it releases, then T3 as an exclusive? Well, so that's a really good point. Uh, you cannot upgrade or downgrade either. So that will violate your 2PL. So. I mean, you can upgrade, but you cannot downgrade. You cannot downgrade and later upgrade because downgrading, the moment you do a downgrade, it essentially, you can think of is that you had two lock and you released one of it. You had two lock, one that you can sort of conceptually think what was protection against write, one was protection against read. And if you downgrade, you're dropping your protection against write. So you did release a lock. And the moment you release a lock, you can no longer acquire new ones. So, so that's, but that's a really important point. I'm glad you brought that up. But again, let's kind of just follow our example. T1, it gets a read lock. T2 wants to get a write lock. This thing is blocked. So we're going to be locked on this. So th this, this is going to be on hold. In fact, depending on the implementation, even T1 itself may not be able to upgrade to write lock. If you, uh, if you design your queue such that once you put this T2 into a queue, any future request will be queued after that. Depending on the implementation, uh, this, uh, even T1 may not be able to upgrade its lock. Uh, that's, that's implementation dependent. Uh, but so 2PL will never allow this. And the other way of looking at it is that what we see is uh, technically speaking, as far as 2PL is concerned, T1 is conflicting with T2, but first is T1 is preceding T2, but then T2 become preceding T1. So there is that conflicting order is that T2 is, uh, it's also, it, T1 is depending on T2 and T2 is also depending on T1. So there, there is that cycle. So it is not conflict serializable and the 2PL would not produce this scheduled. However, what makes this schedule view serializable, which is uh, one of the tricky operations in databases, and I think one of the earlier lectures, one of you had actually pointed this out. What's special about these writes, especially these two from T2 and T3, uh, is that they are blind writes. They're just writing without reading what the value is. Uh, so the blind write is what is uh, allowing the view serializability to not have any intermediate reads. And since there are no intermediate reads, as long as the initial value is satisfied, the final values also goes through. But the problem of the blind writes is a difficult one, especially also in the recovery. If you simply doing blind writes, then, and your database crashes, and those writes has been reflected onto the log, then 
producing the previous value might be problematic or undoing the previous value might be problematic uh, because you didn't read the previous value uh, to log it. Of course, uh, the actual logging may require that you always uh, read the previous value for the purpose of the log. And in technically speaking, you may always be that even if you issue a blind write to the database, the database may do a read anyway. And so any write is kind of internally is always going to be read write. And well, in that case, uh, it won't be conflict serializable again as well, because one read, uh, this read, so there will be a read here again, and that read will need to read the value of T2. So that's where you get that cycle. So, so that's, uh, so that's the intricacy. Usually, view serializability is more, uh, I think, a form of theoretical interest. I mean, not to my knowledge, there's any database that actually uh, provide view serializability, just for the basic facts that often they don't do blind writes. Even if you issue a blind write for the purpose of the log, they may just read the initial value to allow undo or in other words, to allow efficient undo. You could potentially always go back to the beginning of the log somewhere. You may find the initial value that was written and you can recover from there, but that would be uh, inefficient. Uh, so they usually do undo uh, the undo. Uh, for the undo log, they read the, per, uh, the previous values. Of course, in the L store, this problem becomes a bit more interesting because on the multi-version, since we are not actually changing the, uh, we're not uh, doing an in-place update. So that's an easier problem, even with the blind write, because we can easier to recover because the writes is only producing a new record. Then if that is, needs to be, then needs to be aborted and are undo, all we do is simply we mark that record as discarded. And so on the previous value already there. So with L store or in general with multi-version and not doing an in-place update, the problem of handling blind write becomes an easier problem. But in your traditional single version in-place update, the problem of blind write requires more care as far as the recovery is concerned. So that's, uh, that's another uh, interesting, again, from mostly from a theoretical perspective, the view serializability and its properties. So any, actually, any other question? Okay. So since we're talking about lock manager uh, or locking, we need somehow to manage the lock. And what is known as a lock manager and what the lock manager does is often is a data structure, typically perhaps a hash table that allows you to lock and unlock. So it's a hash table that keep track of uh, for every record, uh, the list of lock that is outstanding and the list of lock that are being queued to be fulfilled. Of course, we talked about earlier on with 2VCC and the 2V indirection. I mean, the indirection column can serve as essentially a lock manager. But again, in your DB2, you have a specific lock manager. Again, some form of a hash table internally is implemented in order to manage the list of lock for every record. And the locking is uh, at the record level. Of course, we're gonna talk about hierarchical level locking as well too. And so for log table entry is that the number of transaction currently holding the log and the type of the log they're holding, whether it's a shared log, whether it's exclusive log, and then also uh, the queue of the log. And you somehow will have a pointer to this queue. And this queue probably is implemented as a linked list. So it also has some form of a priority. So a FIFO order. So, uh, that allows ease implementation of that as well. And locking and un unlocking, of course, has to be an atomic operation because if it's not atomic, then well, we will have race condition and we may be giving the same lock simultaneously to two different transactions. And there has been significant, significant amount of development 
fine tuning and optimization that, that major render have done. Years of fine tuning and optimization, millions if not billions of dollars have been spent on developing highly efficient lock manager. It's probably one of the most complicated and most uh, uh, difficult implementation because you have to deal with all these different threads and so many different intricacy arises. And you're all going to kind of experience some of that to some extent for the second assignment because you still have that background merger thread, but really you're gonna really appreciate the importance of lock manager in milestone three. Of course, for those of you who implement a lock-free or an optimistic approach, then, well, you don't really need the lock manager. And so that will definitely simplify your implementation uh, and perhaps even improve the performance. And the other thing that the lock manager does provide is the upgrade, is that if you hold a shared lock, it allows you to do an upgrade to an exclusive lock. Of course, the downgrade is also possible, but as we mentioned before, in order to fulfill the 2PL, an upgrade is okay, but a downgrade essentially is a form of a release. And so once you do a downgrade, then you can no longer acquire any more locks or you can no longer upgrade. Of course, another caveat to that is if you assume we want serializable schedule. Most database system also provides weaker isolation not necessarily serializable. So in those weaker isolation, these upgrade and downgrade could happen uh, interchangeably as well too, because on the weaker consistency model, you no longer are required to uh, stop acquiring a lock once you start releasing it. So for example, DB2 has something called cursor stability and the cursor stability, all it does for every record that it needs to access, whether for read and write, it holds a lock to make sure that no other transaction is accessing it. Once it's done with that record, it releases it. The next time it wants to read a record, it does the lock and then releases it. It does actually hold the lock for the writes till the end of the transaction, but for the write, for the reads, as soon as it reads a record, it releases it. It cursor stability uh, or committed read can be much more efficient than serializability. Most databases offer a variation of that, but of course does not produce a serializable schedule. So it does come at a cost. Any question? And of course we have if we do in locking, then there's always going to be a possibility of having deadlocks. And there are two mechanisms to handle deadlock. One is deadlock prevention. One is deadlock detection. The deadlock prevention is to one example we did with two VCC. We said, if you implement a non-blocking approach, meaning you're never going to actually wait for a lock, by construction, that's a preventive method because if you're never waiting for a lock, they can never even have a deadlock. The deadlock, it only happens if one transaction waiting for another transaction to read a log, but that's very transaction for it that it's waiting. That transaction is waiting for the first transaction to release some of its resources. So you have this double waiting happening. So you can do preventive method, which is a uh, they're often pre uh, much preferred, of course, not always possible. And there's also a detection mechanism is that like a, like a two-phase locking, a standard two-phase locking, there is uh, no prevention. So deadlock could happen. And what the database can do is periodically to check whether uh, if there's a prolonged wait for some transaction, maybe there's a flag that maybe there is a deadlock. So the uh, so there could a, a deadlock detection mechanism could uh, kick in at that point. At that point. So an example of deadlock prevention again is the non-blocking approach that we talked with two VCC, or even a simple approach of a two PL with no wait. Again, that's something we talked about last time as well too. Is that if you want to acquire a lock, the lock is not available. You simply abort. So that's again, another form of uh, preventive measure. But there's a more sophisticated one. For example, 
the priority is based on timestamp. And there are two flavor of this, or at least this, this, these are two flavors. There's other ways of doing it. There is one that is called weight die. And basically this says, if TI has a higher priority and TI and TJ does have the lock, so then TI waits for TJ to complete its operation, release the lock so that TI, a higher priority can later acquire it. But if TI has a lower priority than TJ, then simply TI aborts. So basically the order that is being maintained here is only the higher priority transaction weights. It's never the case that a lower priority weights, uh, a lower priority uh, transaction will wait for a higher priority one. So if it's always the case that the higher priority is waiting, then that creates a one way, uh, one directional way in our dependency graph. So this prevents cycle. Of course, the reverse of this can also be true, uh, that you always make the lower priority to wait for higher priority. As long as you remain consistent on that ordering, it's just a one strict ordering, then we can ensure, uh, use that as a preventive measure. The other one is that the wound weight, if TI has a higher priority, then, and TJ is holding the lock, if TI comes and has a higher priority, and TJ is the one that holds the lock, then uh, TJ aborts. So if a higher priority transaction comes, before we said only the higher priority transaction waits, but now we say if a higher priority transaction comes, then the lower priority transaction that is holding the lock, it needs to be aborted. Otherwise, TI waits. So the first, so this second approach, it favors the higher priority transaction to proceed quicker. And well, the first approach, uh, it still gives a higher priority transaction a chance to execute, uh, but it, it does not. Uh, it does not uh, it does not allow the higher priority to uh, kill an existing transaction so again these are different flavors of it the other interesting flavor of this is that if you hold your lock in a specific order so lock order so is it's the case so this one is a little bit more strict but it, it also works nicely is that if you're a transaction and you need to access 10 locks all the locks in the database are ordered, has a priority. For example, let's say we have 10 records. The first record is a high priority, second record is second priority, third record is third priority, and the 10th record is the 10th priority. And if I need to get locks to three records, and let's say record seven, three, and two, the way I need to request the lock, I always need to lock first two, then three, then five. If I get my lock in order, then I can also sure, be ensured that uh, that lock will never happen Everybody, if all the locks are held in order. So that's another preventive measure. Of course, that preventive measure is a bit more expensive because, or it's more limited because that means a priori, I need to know all the data that I'm accessing because I need to hold those locks in order. And it's possible that you're given a transaction that first you do some reads, and based on those reads, you figure out what records you need to write to, and then you, you read those. So on a general transaction model is that you don't know all the stuff that you need to read and write. That preventive measure, for example, won't work because you don't know all your read and write. And so you cannot ensure that you're acquiring all the locks in order. But if you know that read and write set ahead of time, uh, some assumption, an assumption that we also made in QCC or quick then they can do a lot more interesting uh, optimization. So a lot more clever optimization uh, can be incorporated. Any question? So now here is an interesting question. So if a transaction like a higher priority one or even a lower priority one, uh, so it comes, so we see that TI is actually a lower priority, 
So TI aborts, and we go ahead and try to retry the TI. Now the question is, if we restart the transaction upon the retry, we really need to keep its original timestamp. So the question is, why do we need to keep its original timestamp? So when we do a retry, why not we assign a new timestamp to the transaction? Why is that an important concept? And again, note that the priority of the transaction is based on its timestamp in this um, model. I would say a new timestamp, um, then it's losing its priority. Um, so like it could keep getting pushed off and off if we don't give it its original. Absolutely. So it's important that once you get a priority, you keep it. Otherwise, you're going to get to this starvation that you mentioned, is that if I continuously change the priority of the transaction, then, well, this transaction could be an unlucky one and never get to execute it. But if it's maintained its original one, at least it's maintained its priority, and eventually will become the highest priority transaction, then we are certain that it will successfully execute. So that's, that's a really important element to consider. Any other, any questions, any thoughts, any remarks? Again, all of these are potential. So if you do any of these variation, uh, so it will also count as a bonus for your third milestone. Of course, actually for your third milestone, I did add that simplification that the two PL locking that you're doing can be a no wait, meaning that there are no waiting. So by default, the milestone three does not have to deal with deadlock because it has the simple preventive measure of simply no wait. And if you're not waiting well, trivially, you cannot have a deadlock. But all of these could be a, a, an enhanced version, either these methods or QCC or 2VCC or others that we're going to talk about. So that would be an interesting uh, opportunity for getting bonus for milestone three. Okay, so the other one, which is a detection, so we can create a weight, weight for graph. So the way the, this graph is constructed, very similar to the dependency graph we talked about. Nodes are transaction, and there is, a, there is an edge from TI to TJ. If TI is waiting for TJ, uh, and then periodically we simply check for cycles. So we, as we execute transactions, we, can, uh, we maintain this graph and periodically, maybe every second or every half a second or every 10 seconds, we examine this graph to make sure there's no cycles. Of course, running a cycle on a graph, checking for cycles on a graph is not a cheap operation. So it does, does definitely add overhead to the concurrency. So let's look at an example. So we have a transaction T1, T2, T3, and four. And so S means shared, X means exclusive lock. So this means transaction T1 is getting a shared lock on A, then it reads A. Transaction T2 first gets an exclusive lock on B and then writes B. So that's the notation we're using. And again, the requirement that we said, there is an edge from TI to TJ if TI is waiting for TJ to release. So there is that dependency. So when we start, well, T1 is uh, red A and then T2 starts. Well, T2 right now is not really interested in A. And so it just wants B, so it can be granted B. But then, T1 now wants to read B, but since T2 already holds a lock on B, an exclusive lock on B, then T1 needs to wait. And since T1 is waiting for T2, then there is an edge from T1 to T2. Now we continue our schedule and the concurrent execution and the T3 comes in, T3 wants to read C it gets a lock on C, everything is good. And now T2 also now wants to write to C. But since T2 needs T1 to first release its read lock, then T2 is dependent on T3. So now there is an edge 
T2 to point into to T3 because T3 needs to release its lock first before T2 can progress. Okay. And again, as we continue the execution, now T4 needs to write to B. But as we said before, T2 already holds a lock on B. So now T4 also becomes dependent on T2. So, so far, everything is good. I mean, if you were to, there's a bunch of weight is happening, but there's no issue. I mean, if we were kind of running our detection, there's no cycle, uh, everything is good. But what could go wrong here at this? What, what is the one possible operation that could happen next and causes an issue for us? For example, if now T3 also wants to read A, and we know that T1 is holding a lock on A, so now if T3 wants to write to A while T1 is holding a shared lock, so then what we're going to happen is that it's going to be a dependency from T3 to T1. Now, if the deadlock detection kicks in right now, it sees that T1, T3, is waiting for T1, but T1 is waiting for T2, but T2 is waiting for T3. So the cycle is formed and therefore we have a deadlock. And the only way to resolve this deadlock is that to drop one of these edges. That means if you were to abort any of these transactions, whether T1, T2, or T3, if you abort one of them, the cycle is removed and uh, the deadlock is uh, resolved. So that would be an example of detection mechanism. It continues to construct this graph or maintain this graph and you periodically uh, check for cycle and if cycle arises, you know you have dependency problem, you know you have a deadlock issue and then well, the, uh, what can be done at this point is to just basically uh, abort one of them. But it's possible that when you run your detection mechanism, you find many cycles. So then you try to find minimum number of transaction to uh, kill or to abort in order to release all cycles. So for example, if T3 was involved in five other cycles, but T1 and T2 were not involved in any other cycles, then it's more makes sense to just abort T3 because by aborting T3, many cycles are eliminated. Uh, so that could be further optimization. But again, this problem, there's interest, it's an interesting problem, number of optimization, but you can start seeing that transaction code is, needs to be super efficient. And you wanna minimize these deadlocks. You wanna minimize the wait time for the locks, but all of these algorithms now adding overhead. So that's what makes the, uh, the concurrency again, it's a challenging problem, especially if you want to make it uh, efficient. And more parallelism you have, that means the bigger this graph could potentially be. The more concurrency, concurrency that you have, potentially this is going to be a, a, a bigger graph. And so it becomes more complicated in that sense as well or expensive. Any question? Okay. So we talked about locking. We talked about uh, 2PL as a way of getting conflict serializable. We talked about uh, how do you determine whether a, a schedule is conflict serializable by looking at its dependency graph. And we said if you use 2PL, we can ensure we're gonna get conflict serializable. And, but then we could have deadlock. And in order to avoid deadlock, we even need to have preventive measure, or we could have a detection mechanism. And one detection mechanism, which is analogous to creating a dependency graph, we create a wait for graph to look for cycle. So next level of locking is what if we wanna support multiple gran uh, granularity? 
Uh, what if not just we have locks on tables, but we have locks on pages and tables and databases. So no longer just on tuples and records, but now we can have locks on page, tables, and database. And so essentially we have this nested or this hierarchy of locks. So now the first question is, can you think of why this will be beneficial? Why would we care to have this hierarchical locking? Why not just stick with our record level or tuple level locking? What could be the potential benefit here? Well, I mean, for example, that with L store, isn't it like a shared lock over all of the base pages? Could that be like an example? Uh, well, that's technically speaking, that's just an implementation uh, choice. There's no necessity to have any shared lock on any of the base pages. Right. Uh, so that's an implementation choice that you want or simplification, but you are on the right uh, on the right track. But why is that beneficial having that single lock on the on the base page? What's the benefit of that? Well, like that ba those base pages are only going to be read. Um, so you don't want any uh, issues with concurrency. But what would have been the alternative to that? I guess that would be the question. If you didn't, if you didn't, if you didn't have the ability to hold the lock at the base page level, what would be the alternative? Do you mean like the page range level, like higher up, or more granular, like the page level? So I guess the question is, why would it be beneficial? Why would bother having higher level locks? Why not just stick with the topple level or record level locking? Why would it be beneficial to even consider having locks at different, at a higher level? What happens if you want to change every record in your database? What do you have to do? There's two ways to do it. You could go get a lock on every single tuple, every single record, or if you could just get a single lock and just have an exclusive access to the entire database, it makes it simpler. So this higher level locking allows us to uh, get coarser level lock to eliminate the need of having getting individual locks. So for example, if I know I'm going to change the entire page range, as opposed to take a lock on every single record individually, I could potentially get an exclusive lock on the entire range, or I could get an exclusive lock on the entire page, or I could get even an exclusive lock on a table, or finally I could get an exclusive lock just on the entire database. I wanna do a complete reorg, for example. I want to change all my schema or I want to add all kinds of indexes and I don't want anything happen during that, uh, during that period. So I can just simply get an exclusive log at a high level. And that will prevent, uh, prevent, uh, or prevent concurrent access and also eliminate the need of maintaining low granularity lock or fine grain lock. So it would be cheaper in terms of its implementation as well. Too. So that would be the, the key benefit. But now it becomes interesting or it become a bit of a challenge. How do we now, if somebody's holding a database lock and if I'm another transaction and I'm hold and I just want to read or write to a single tuple, how do I coordinate with someone who has a lock on the entire database. How do I deal with that situation? Can you think of a way of coordinating that? Or if somebody's holding a lock on a table and I just want a single record, how do I even figure it out if somebody has a lock on a table? 
there is needs to be some form of a coordination or a communication. How can we now resolve that communication? How does someone can announce that they're holding a lock on the entire table? And how can I announce that I'm holding an exclusive lock on a single record in a coherent way? Just via the lock table entry you were describing earlier? Sure, but do I need to introduce new kind of locks or how do I, how, do, how does it, how would it work? So the question is, what would be one way of implementing it? Uh, couldn't it be like in the schema, like you could have a bit that just, it's either on or off and that shows if there's a lock on the entire page? Sure, that's even a lower level. I'm talking about a more on a conceptual level. So one way of handling that is that if I'm a, if I need to write a, if I need to do a write to a particular tuple, at a page level, I could have an intention lock saying that I'm planning to do some write. At a table level, I could have an intention log saying that I'm planning to do some write. At a database level, I'm also need to hold a log saying that I'm planning to write something. So now, if a transaction comes and wants to change the entire database, and it wants to get a log at the database level, but it sees there's also an intention to change something, then it won't be able to, that, that lock would not be granted. So that becomes a way of communicating or coordinating by introducing these additional level of locks, but now enforcing that all transaction to actually get lock at the appropriate, uh, at the appropriate uh, degree at every level. So if I only wanna do read, then I need the intention of read at the database level, intention of a read at a table level, at the page level, and finally at the top of level. And if a new transaction comes that just wants read the entire database, then it can just get a shared log at the high level. So this introduces what is called this um, multi-granularity kind of logs. And so to allow, so first we're going to introduce new kind of locks, what is called IS, intention to share, intention to, or intention to read, IX, intention to write. And these are the old lock that we had, shared lock and exclusive lock. And this is the conflict uh, or uh, conflict table. In a sense that if there's a check mark that, and this is, means no lock, holding no locks. And if, if there's a check mark, that means there's no conflict. If it's empty, that means it's conflict. So an intention to share does not conflict with another intention to share. So I can, uh, at the database level, if there are two transactions just want to read, they both hold an IS lock at the database level, the table level, page level, and then finally record level. There is no, uh, there is no conflict. Also, if the, I'm a transaction that I'm planning to do some writes to some record, then I have to hold an IX lock at the, at the top level. But an IX, uh, an IX lock or intention to exclusion at the top level does not conflict with the intention to share because it's possible that they're not reading and writing the same record. So again, there is no conflict between that. And also two transaction that wants to change the data, again, they get intention to share at the high level and that's fine, there's no conflict. But of course, if there is a data, if I said at the high level, there is a record, there's a query that just wants to read everything, instead of getting an intention lock at the top level and then get individual lock at the lower level, they can just get a shared, lab, shared lock right at the top level. And if they get a shared lock at the high level, then the intention to write or the actual exclusive lock no longer can be granted at the top level. So the moment somebody holds a shared level at the database level, 
the only type of other queries that can come in are those that are only planning to read. If I hold the shared lock at the table level, then for that table, any new queries has to be read only. Now, you can also get an exclusive lock at the higher level. The moment you get an exclusive lock at the higher level, nothing else can come in. So no other queries can either read or write the data if I get it at a higher level. So that's the new set of locks that are getting introduced in order to support this multi-granularity, in order to support the ability to just lock an entire page or the ability to just lock an entire table or the ability to run to lock the entire page range and avoid the need of getting the individual locks. Of course, this means there is an additional overhead for the transaction that we're only going to access few records because now they also need to get these additional intention lock at the higher level. And then the way the locking works, you always lock from top down because you first you get your higher level locks, but when you release the lock, you always do bottom up. So first you release at the leaf level, then one level higher and then one level. It's a new kind of lock, which is called six. And this is essentially getting an shared lock and exclusive at the same time. And why is that beneficial? This says that I want to read everything. So I don't want, I want to read everything, but I only want to change few records. So this allows read-only transaction, other read-only transaction. If I get a six at the top level, I make sure that no uh, new transaction can, uh, can write to anything, but I'm not preventing the reader. So I, uh, I hold out all the write transaction, but I allow any transaction that wants to read. But they are get they do also get informed that I'm also going to change some of the record. So they also need to uh, make sure they get their low level locking because it might be the case that the records that they're uh, reading. I am going to be modifying as well too. So that's yet another type of um, mo uh, mode that is introduced. And this is something that is very uh, very classical. So um, any 2PL, any sort of major render, database render that implements 2PL does have multi-granularity locking and it does have all these type of lock. And you, you may have already noticed that this IX lock, it's very similar to that update intention lock that we had. This is, I, that's what IX is, an intention to update. So in 2BCC, when we talked about the update lock, that can actually be mapped to this IX lock. So that's, uh, I guess, another interesting uh, connection to what we have discussed. Any question? On why do we need multi-granularity logs and the way we go about uh, acquiring it or uh, implementing that? Yeah, and as, uh, as mentioned in the chat, having these uh, higher level locks helps us to reduce the number of locks we need to maintain, especially when we're doing large updates. Of course, the, uh, the flip side of that is that now short update transaction needs to maintain these higher level locks. It also means that table level lock or page level lock, or even, or especially the database level lock becomes very hot. Everybody wants to get it. Everybody needs to get an IS. Majority of the time they need to get IS, IX, IS, IX. So lots of activity at the higher level. So dealing with the concurrency at the higher level, uh, it becomes, that's a source of contention. So that's another implementation challenge that one needs to uh, focus with. So, and kind of following what we said, each transaction always starts from the root of the hierarchy, and then it either gets S or IS logs on a node. And uh, in order to get this S or IS, at the higher level, it needs to either have an intention to read or intention to write. So to get a, at the current level, to be able to get a shared log or an intention to share, you must have 
same level of a log, strength of the log at the parent node. And so that applies, so that combination kind of applies. Let's kind of, uh, I think best, uh, and so all the other way, if you wanna get an X, IX or six on a node, then you either need to have IX or six on a higher level. So again, you always need to, to make sure that the moment you wanna do a, a, a write, a sum write intention needs to be at the higher level. If you wanna do some read, a read intention needs to be at the higher level. So at the very least, that needs to be uh, announced. That's essentially announcing that I'm going to, at the higher level, you're announcing that I'm going to do potential write. And that will be a method to communicate with other transaction that are planning to perhaps get a lock on the entire table is that, well, we can't quite get the full shared lock on exclusive lock because there are other transactions already in the system that are planning to make minor changes across. across. So that's, uh, again, that's the, the importance of that. And of course, we have to release bottom up. So that's also important as well. So let's look at example. So if T1 wants to scan the entire relation R, but update a few tuples, what kind of a lock it should hold? So T1 wants to read the entire table, but it only wants to update a few tuples. So what would be the most appropriate lock that minimizes the amount of locking that needs to be done? Those few tuples. So read everything, changes few things. Oh, okay. Would be a six, SIX. Yeah, exactly. So we need a six, uh, need a six lock on R and occasionally upgrade it to the X. And so essentially upgrading our shared or upgrading I IX to an, uh, to an X. So but the moment you have an S on R, that means nobody else can change R, but that means others can continue reading R. So in order to ensure that we not violating the repeatability of other transaction for any records that we need to write, we need to do that upgrade to the X lock. So now T2 uses an index to read only part of R. So what, can, what do we need here? What kind of a lock do we need at the higher level, at the level of R? Yes, as someone said in the chat, it's we only need an IS at the R level, but then we need to repeatedly get an S lock on the top. If you didn't have multi granularity, what would happen? We still have to get this repeatedly, repeatedly get the S, but now we're adding an overhead of getting an IS lock. So that's an overhead. However, in this case, since we're having an S lock on R, we eliminated the need of getting a individually get a shared lock on every single record. So huge benefit here, but of course it's adding a, an overhead for these smaller transaction. Now, if T3 wants to read all of R, what kind of a lock should we get at a level of R? I mean, that's very similar to the first case. So just needed an S lock. We know we're not changing anything here. We also wanted to read everything. So simply getting a single shared lock on R, we no longer have to do any individual lock. So huge saving by allowing to get an S. Of course, once we get an S, we can look at our table. The only other 
transaction that can be allowed if they are reading S or IS. So no longer any transaction that may even change a single record can no longer enter. They have to wait because uh, at the R level, we're getting an S and S only allows IS or S, meaning no, read, no more writes. And even this transaction itself, since it's only holding an S at the high level, it doesn't, cannot do any write. If it needed to do also some write, it needed to hold the six. Or alternatively, we could have just get an IS, but then get a lock on every single record. Uh, but that would not be uh, efficient, especially if you want to read everything because then they would have had to uh, request a lock on every single record. So T3, this first method is sort of really the preferred way of doing it because with a single lock, now we can safely just read all the records in that table. So I think this is a good point to stop and pause. And let me know if anybody has any questions. Otherwise, uh, have a wonderful day, everyone.